All right, this is OpenStax US History, Chapter 10, Section 4, Indian Removal. So in terms of Jackson's presidency, this is the third significant event to occur, uh, nullification crisis being one, bank war being two. Lastly, the change in Indian policy. One thing that we should remember is that the United States was very much defined as a white republic at that time. You can see it in some of the wordings of the Constitution although it did not explicitly say uh, white in the Constitution. It did exclude Native Americans as separate from the United States and also identified black slaves as other peoples. However, this is more clear in something like the Naturalization Act, which was passed by Congress in 1790, very early on in the Constitution, and defined citizenship as being free white persons, all right, if you could fall under essentially that category. And you can also think of it in terms of uh, the right to vote as well. Uh, so this, uh, you know, at this particular moment, uh, you know, even from the Constitution onwards, Native Americans were considered a distinct and separate and sovereign group uh, apart from the United States. Additionally, you have the reputation of Andrew Jackson himself, and he had a history and very much a reputation of being an Indian fighter. As a general, he had gone to war against Native Americans a number of instances. Uh, some examples are, you know, the Creek Wars against the Creek Indians in 1813. Of course, there is the War of 1812, in which the British had some Native American allies, you know, fighting against people like Tecumseh. And uh, the Seminole War, which was fought in Florida in 1817. So Jackson certainly himself was no friend to Native Americans. On top of that, add the portrayal of Indians in American popular culture at the time, very rich in anti-Indian sentiments, uh, the depiction that Indians are savages uh, and uh, really serve as an obstacle to white settlement of the West. This was true in books like The Last of the Mohicans, written in 1826, but also in things like artwork. Uh, this portrayal of Native Americans here also illustrates this, uh, this theme uh, in American culture as Native Americans being savages and, you know, the need to, uh, to remove them or, or, you know, that they stand as an obstacle to white settlement of the West. And so one thing to recall is that, you know, during the constitutional period, and even afterwards, Native Americans were seen as sovereign and separate tribes. So, you know, this was a policy that was initiated by, you know, uh, Washington and, and really the early Congress. But, you know, since the United States had acquired territory from the Louisiana Purchase, there were a lot more Indians living in American territory by the 1800s uh, than there were, you know, in 1789 or 1790 when the Constitution was in effect. And essentially, the situation was sometimes what we call nations within a nation. And that was there were nations of Native Americans. This is a very poorly drawn uh, half of the United States. That's supposed to be Florida, Texas, whatever. And, uh, you know, there were groups of people who had signed treaties with the United States government that created their own separate land. But as you might imagine, this became a bigger and bigger issue as more white settlers moved west and as the size of the United States uh, continued to increase. So, you know, these separate like islands would have been sovereign to the tribes that agreed to those treaties. They could make whatever laws that they wanted to. They were not subject to U.S. law. But in a sense, as time went on, and especially with the profitability of cotton and the desire for land to grow cotton on, there was increasingly more and more pressure on Native Americans by state and local authorities. And it pretty much amounted to the argument between Indian sovereignty and state sovereignty. Because in this, there are essentially kind of three governments at play. There is the federal government, you know, which is in Washington, D.C. There is the state government, which, of course, are each of the states. And then there is also the Indian governments or the Native Americans. Now, essentially, the treaty to occupy that land exists between the federal government 
and the Native Americans. So according to the federal government, Indians have the right to um, have the right to occupy that land. However, from the state government, they are wanting to essentially kick Native Americans out. And so in essence, it also becomes an issue between the federal government and the states. This is most clearly the case with uh, the five civilized tribes in, uh, in Georgia, mostly, mostly is what it is, specifically in, in uh, the South. And uh, they're referred to as the five quote unquote civilized tribes because you know the English language was adopted, Christianity was adopted. Uh, here's a Cherokee uh, newspaper. Um, and, um, you know, many of those Native Americans had assimilated into essentially American culture. Uh, the tribes are, if I can recall all of them, the Creek, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw. And what's the last one that I'm, uh, that I'm missing here? It's one of the non- the non C's, uh, let me see, Seminole, all right, Seminole are the tribes that are being referred to. Uh, and so Congress pushes this along with the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which allows states, so this gives states the power to remove Indians uh, outside their borders outside their borders. And the territory that they would be moved to would be Oklahoma. This would be called Indian Territory. Now, tribes like the Cherokee uh, fight back and sue. In a Supreme Court case, Cherokee versus the state of Georgia in 1831, the Cherokees sue to keep their land. In this case, the Supreme Court rules against the Cherokee. However, in a Supreme Court case just one year later, Worcester versus Georgia, Justice John Marshall, who we remember or can recall as being a very strong Federalist, uh, even though the Federalist Party doesn't exist anymore, John Marshall still believes in a very strong central government. And in this ruling, he sides, John Marshall does, Worcester versus Georgia, uh, sides with the Cherokee and surprise, uh, sorry, and uh, sides with the federal government, essentially denying the state of Georgia the right to remove the Cherokee nation. He says that the Cherokee and other Indians are distinct political communities and have the right, excuse me, the right to the land. However, despite the ruling by the Supreme Court, um, John Marshall and the Supreme Court have no way of enforcing it. And instead, the states retain the practical power and the president, Andrew Jackson, certainly doesn't have any uh, issues with seeing Indians removed. Jackson sort of famously says of this decision that Marshall made his, de made his decision let him enforce it. In other words, uh, oops. In other words, the Supreme Court has no way of actually enforcing its rule. And, um, you know, the process of Indian removal uh, goes underway regardless. Native Americans living within the states, uh, particularly in the South, but also in the North, are given a, an ultimatum, a timeline, either move or you will be forcibly removed. Those that refuse to remove ultimately were moved by the military. You can see this depicted here in the image. Uh, here you see some of the communities, the Chickasaw and the Choctaw that occupy Mississippi. Here you see the land of the Cherokee and the Creek. And lastly, down here in Florida, the land of the Seminole. And over 15,000 Indians were forcibly marched into Oklahoma, which was coined and, and, and termed Indian Territory because it didn't belong to any particular state. There was no state government there. It was only under federal authority. This event is known as the Trail of Tears. So we'll call it the Forcible Migration. 
of Indians uh, from states to Oklahoma. It wasn't called Oklahoma at the time, but that's the state that it would eventually become. 4,000 people lost their lives along this forced migration due to lack of food, lack of water, exposure to the elements. This change in Indian policy to removal also led to more conflict. Uh, Black Hawk or Black Hawk's War was a war or an attempt, we might say, by Black Hawk, who was the leader of this. You see his image illustrated by here. And others to reclaim land and uh, led to more armed conflict. Ultimately, the United States was victorious in this conflict.